Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, uh, the third of our Tree Council Seed Gathering Season webinars. Uh, there are a lot of you coming this afternoon, and we are just going to let the doors open and let you all flood in. So I'm going to blether for a few minutes before I introduce Sheila. Um, it always helps for me to, and Sheila to understand where you're from around the country. So if you'd like to use the chat button and just tell us where you're from, um, and start telling us whereabouts in the in the UK, but possibly in the world you are. We would we would love to know. And there we go. First up, we're in Bath and Bolton, and we're in Rutland and Salisbury, and we're going to be all over the country, from Sheffield to Oxford to York to Wilton Keynes, and now you're too fast and Guernsey, and I can't even keep up to Cornwall and all places and beyond. Um, and from Margate. So welcome everybody. We just we'll just let the doors open, let people uh, turn up. So please, as I say, just tell us where you are in where you are in the country, and then I shall introduce Sheila, and we shall talk about seeds. My name's John. I'm uh, director of trees and science at the Tree Council. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this slightly overcast where I am in Portsmouth. Um, Wednesday lunchtime, but it's nice to see you from Essex ooh, to California. Hi, Carla, in California. That's quite that's quite hardcore to be up at five o'clock in the morning, <laughs> even for a really good seed gathering discussion. And Heidi, um, hello from the Epsom Downs. Um, so welcome everybody. Just I know we've got a, a quite a few more still to come, so I'm just going to give it another minute or two before we start. Um, so thank you all. Oh, is it wet? Is it wet? Ah, oh, Roberts in wet in snow down here. That's sad because it's quite nice down here on the south coast. Grey, but quite nice. Um, but you do have the advantage of some rather nice mountains, so which we definitely don't have in southern Hampshire. Um, so we're going to start, um, and this is our third event in our sort of season this autumn of seed gathering events, looking at the fascinating world of tree seeds. And I have great pleasure this afternoon in welcoming our special guest, and she's Sheila McCartin. And Sheila is currently the Research and Development Manager at Mailor Forest Nurseries. And Mailor, for those of you that may not know, are a wholesale forest nursery specialising in the production of bare root trees and shrubs, suitable for all sorts of purposes hedging and native planting and they're renowned for having labs and looking at research and we'll come on to that in a second. Sheila herself is a self-declared green-fingered botanist with a, with a background in plant propagation. She did her PhD on aspects of plant tissue culture particularly acclimation and stress and we might ask we might ask Sheila what the words acclimation and stress mean later um, in her native South Africa but she then started to work as uh, forest researchers or as one of forest researchers senior seed scientists or maybe these senior seed scientists and she delivered a program of tree seeds and seedling research managed the labs for forest research and supervised the train and trained and mentored uh, forest research staff and students in the space of seed and currently at Maylor, um she's running a, a cutting edge research program on particularly focusing on automaton, automation um, and the production of conifers. And you can see that my background is a fake one because I'm obviously not up a Scottish <laughs> mountain, not up a Scottish mountain with dwarf willow at the moment or net leaf willow as this one is. Um, but to my intrigue and surprise, Sheila's background is real. <laughs> and that isn't one of these, um, that's a real background. And you might see real people walking around in it later. It depends on whether they need the lab. And we will we will explore um, what Sheila does in in uh, her current job as well. Um, if you'd like to ask a question as we go through the event, please could you use the Q and A box um, to ask questions, and we will come back to questions as we go. Uh, I might ask questions of Sheila live uh, if they come up and they're particularly pertinent pertinent to something she's just said or we might come back at it at the end uh, and we have some questions that some of you have provided for us in advance um, but I'm hoping that you will give us some questions that we can explore together about tree seeds and why they why they matter and how they work 
So that's the purpose of today's session. And as Sheila said in the title, we're going to look at tree seeds in a nutshell, that whole element of why seed biology uh, works, how it matters and what it does for the trees in your landscape. So I'm gonna pass this over to Sheila, who is gonna start with an introduction to herself perhaps, and to some of the different species and some of the different biologies of those different species. So thank you, Sheila, over to you. Um, I think we're disappearing off camera for a second, but you will hear our voices. Um, and if I get questions from you, or if I get things that I think we need to unpack, we will we will come and explore those as we go. So Sheila, welcome. Thank you for joining us and over to you. Thank you very much, John. So um, I'm going to switch my screen on and share my screen. And um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the challenges that trees face during reproduction and some of the strategies that increase the likelihood of successful seedling survival. And I'm using five examples, two broad leaves and three conifers, which are all native to um, Britain. And what I'll be doing is touching a little bit on the reproduction life cycle, um, a little bit on seed structure, and then some information about the dormancy breakage mechanisms. Um, so to kick off, if I can get the slide to move. To kick off, um, we're gonna start off with pedunculate oak. Um, and pedunculate oak is a very large broadleaf um, occurring throughout Britain and most of Europe. And it produces female and male flowers on the same tree. So in other words, it's classed as monoecious. And the female flowers are very, very small, red, shiny structures that you can see on the left-hand side of the picture, um, while the male flowers um, occur on long catkins, um, yellow-green, and they produce huge amounts of of wind dispersed pollen. So pollination, um, which is when the pollen um, lands on the female flower, on the ovule, um, and fertilization occurs very, very rapidly. And after a few weeks, you'll see small acorns developing, pretty much like the, the picture in the middle. Now, both the female flowers and the male flowers can be parasitized by gall wasps. So on the left-hand side, there's an example of a knopper gall, and these form when the female wasps lay their eggs in the female flower buds. And the acorns then develop abnormally with all these ridges and furrows, eventually turning brown and woody before being shed in autumn. The gall wasps has quite a complicated life cycle because then it emerges the following spring and parasitizes the male catkins of the turkey oak for the next part of the life cycle. There are a large number of different types of gall wasps that um, parasitize oak. And on the right hand side, you'll see a different type of gall wasp that has parasitized the male flowers, um, producing a current gall. Now, acorns. Um, are shed in September or October. Um, they essentially are large seeded fruits and they're classed as recalcitrant. And what this means is they shed with very high moisture contents. So in the case of petunculate oak, um, the acorns may have a moisture content as high as 50 to 50%, 50 to 55% water or moisture. Um, so basically half the acorn is water. And this means that the acorns are very susceptible to drying out um, so below a critical threshold, which is 38% in the case of Plunker Oak, the acorns rapidly start dying. Because the acorns have a high moisture content, they also remain metabolically active. And what that means is they continue to take up oxygen, producing carbon dioxide, water and heat as byproducts of respiration. And this means that acorns are very difficult to store. They've got a short shelf life because they're prone to fungal infection and premature germination. So unlike orthodox seeds, acorns do not undergo maturation drying um, before the final stage of, which is the, form, uh, the final stage of development before shedding. 
um, and there's no clear endpoint. So the acorns can germinate rapidly without the need for any additional water. And this sometimes happens when the acorns are still on the tree. So I mentioned that acorns are very large seeded fruits. And when acorns are cut in half, usually one large seed is visible. But sometimes they are twins. And just like humans, these could be fraternal or identical. And if we look at the acorn structure, um, moving from the outwards inwards, um, there's a hard, shiny brown layer, which is the pericarp. And just below that, there's a thin papery layer, which is a seed coat. At the bottom, at the pointy end of the, the acorn, you, you'll see the embryo. It's marked with a small E. And attached to the embryo are two very large um, fleshy cotyledons, which are marked with a C. And the cotyledons are just storage reserves. And in the case of peduncular oak, like most other white oaks, the storage reserves are mostly carbohydrate um, as opposed to lipid, which occurs mostly in red oaks. And these storage reserves are critical for early seeding development. Now, the cut test is often done on acorns as a quick check. It's quick. Right, it's Sorry? It's John. Um, we've just had a question, and just, just uh, apologies, but but um, Rhiannon's asked, is all that you're saying true for sessile, uh, for sessile oak as well, or are we going to have a slightly different story about those in a, in a while? No, sessile oak and peduncular oak are both white oaks, um, so they'd be very similar. So similar in terms of reproduction, similar in terms of structure, and similar in terms of carbohydrate storage. Um, Thank you. So um, I, I was telling you about the, um, the cut test. And um, essentially, what you're looking for in a cut test is a quick way to determine whether the seeds are live or dead or insect infested. And what you're looking for are seeds where the cotyledons are white and firm. Um, any brown or black areas, particularly on the embryo or close to the embryo, means that the seeds are classed as dead. So the cut test, as the name implies, um, is destructive. Um, but the x-ray test is a very quick, simple, and non-destructive way. And although it's not a like-for-like -like test, um, it can be used to determine whether seeds are filled, empty, mechanically damaged, or insect infested. And if you look at these four acorns in the middle, those acorns are all filled. You can see that the um, black area covers the entire inside of, of the acorn. And because this um, is a uniform shade, um, and because water is extra opaque, I suspect that those acorns are alive. But if you look at this acorn over here, you can see some very clear channels. And these channels are caused by the larvae of acorn weevils munching their way through the cotyledons on the way to freedom. And it's quite usual to see exit holes in acorns. Now, the beauty of this test is that it's quick, it's non-destructive, and it means it's very, very useful when you're assessing small and valuable seed lots, um, potentially for biosecurity risks as well. So I mentioned earlier, earlier that uh, acorns germinate within days or weeks of falling onto the ground. And these graphs show germination on the left-hand side and shoot emergence on the right-hand side. And along the x-axis, you've got weeks. Um, so we've got incubation of, germinate of, uh, of acorns at three different temperatures, 5, 10, and 15 degrees Celsius. And in the left-hand graph, the blue line shows germination at 5 degrees. It's very slow and steady, but finally reaching close to 100% after 20 weeks, whereas germination was far more rapid at 10 and 15 degrees, which is indicated by the orange and the gray lines, respectively. And if you look at the right-hand graph, you'll see that there was no shoot emergence at 5 degrees, with the blue line flatlining. 
80% germinate shoot emergence at 10 degrees within 20 weeks, and that's the orange line, and 90% emergence within 12 weeks, the gray line. And this lag between germination, when the radical or the root protrudes, and when the shoots emerge is known as epicotal dormancy. And what this does is it ensures that germination occurs in autumn while shoot emergence occurs in spring. And this increases the likelihood of seedling survival and establishment. Now seed predation is another issue for large seeded um, acorns. Um, so a few years ago, myself and my technicians, Rob and Sonia, test some anti-predation treatments. Uh, we looked at control acorns, which were untreated, but we also treated some acorns and coated them with a waxy layer, which contained either garlic or capsaicin, which is the active ingredient in chili. And we attached all the acorns uh, with a string to plastic boards. We set up motion activated cameras with night vision. And within one night, the culprit, which you can see in the center of the screen, removed almost 100 acorns. Um, and if you think about that, that's quite impressive because each acorn weighs in a region of three to five grams. What's more is the culprit came back the following three nights and removed the, the chili and garlic flavored acorns as well. So our, our treatment was a complete flop. If we move on to Scott's pine, um, it's our only native pine species in Britain, um, but it's widespread throughout the Northern Hemisphere. And like peduncular oak, the trees have both male and female flowers um, on the same tree. But in contrast, Scots pine has a long and complicated reproductive cycle that spans three years. So in year one, the male and female flowers are initiated, but then go dormant. In year two, the male flowers, which are indicated in the center and the right-hand side, they enlarge and shed pollen in May or June, often as pollen clouds, which are wind dispersed. And at the same time, the female flowers on the right -hand, uh, left hand side secrete pollination drops that trap pollen. And these pollination drops are then withdrawn into the pollen chambers for pollination, fertilization. But in Scott's pine, Fertilization only occurs in year three, and that's almost a full year after pollination. And then the seeds develop and they mature and they shed in that autumn. So what this means is that Scots pine and many other pines too, have two generations of cones on the tree at any one time. And these cones experience the same weather, but at different times of, at, at different developmental stages. And this is a proper belt and braces approach because one stage might be very vulnerable to an extreme weather event, but another stage might be less vulnerable. So for instance, persistent heavy rain during May or June will hamper successful pollination in the current generation, but is unlikely to have much effect on fertilization in an older generation. So the seeds are shed in autumn, winter. They're small and winged. Um, seed color is quite variable, ranging from yellow, light brown, dark brown, and even black. And this is probably due to genetics and the environment. Now, unlike oak, Scott's pine seeds are shed with shallow physiological dormancy. And what this means is the seeds will not germinate very readily under optimal um, environmental conditions. So the degree of dormancy um, is dependent on the weather that the mother tree um, is exposed to during seed development, amongst other factors. And this is a type of bet hedging strategy that spreads the risk over time. So what I'll do is show you some lab germination tests a bit, a bit later. So critically, um, Scots pine seeds are classed as orthodox rather than recalcitrant like the acorns. And this means that the seeds undergo maturation drying just before they shed. 
with a very low moisture content. And these seeds can be stored for decades and decades if done correctly. Now, Harrington's two rules of thumb state that seed longevity or shelf life decreases by half with every 1% increase in moisture content or five degrees increase in storage temperature. So it's always prudent to test the viability of seeds before sowing. And this is a classic viability test, uh, the tetrazoleum stain. Live seeds respire and produce enzymes which bind with the stain and form a red precipitate. So allowable staining patterns vary from species to species, but usually one is looking for uniform staining across the embryo and the food reserves. Sometimes though, small unstained or white areas are allowed on the food reserves. So the seed on the left is stained uniformly in the embryo and the food reserves. So that seed is live, but the seed on the right is dead as it's completely white. I mentioned that Scott's pine has um, variable dormancy and these graphs show the number of seeds that germinated from seed lots collected from a single seed orchard, but in different crop years. So the seeds um, were collected in 2007, 2009 and 2010. And we have three different treatments here. We have um, a control, which is a blue treatment. So they were not treated at all. And then we've got two pre-chills where we subject the, the seeds to a, a moist chill to break dormancy. And we did that for four and eight weeks respectively, indicated by the green and the red lines. And if you look at the center graph, you'll see that the blue line peaks around about 17 degrees Celsius, which is the optimum temperature for germination um, for the species. But with a pre-chill, you can see that the seeds germinate over a wide range of temperatures. And what this means is Scott's pine does not need a pre-chill. There's no absolute requirement for a pre-chill, but it does benefit from a pre-chill because it promotes rapid and uniform germination over a wider temperature range. So, Common juniper is one of only three native conifers in Britain. Um, it occurs widely throughout the Northern Hemisphere in Europe, Asia, and North America. Now, unlike the previous two species, peduncular oak and Scots pine, juniper produces male and female flowers on separate bushes. And juniper also has a very long, complicated reproductive cycle that spans two or three years. So the female bushes often have two or more generations of berries at the same time. And this means that the reproductive burden causes female bushes to grow slower and to live shorter lifespans than male bushes. Now in the picture there, you'll see a female cone with a pollination drop on the left-hand side and male flowers or male cones on the right-hand side, close to shedding pollen. And the pollen um, is dispersed around about April or May of each year. So I've got a short video here. It's about 90 seconds long. There is no sound, so I'll talk over it. Um, but I made this video a long, long time ago, so it's a little clunky. But essentially what I'm going to show you here is the pollen drop mechanism in action. So what I did is I applied pollen um, and also applied barbecue ash as a separate control. So if we go through the video, juniper in Yorkshire, female cones with the pollination drops, changes in berry color from mature green to pink to purple blueberries, which are mature a male flower dehissing pollen and a female flower with three pollination drops. And this is early stages of pollen uh, of male flower development. And over here, you can see that I've sprinkled pollen 
um, over the female flower. And you can see that the pollination drops have withdrawn completely into the pollen chamber. And that's essential for the production of filled live seeds. And in this example, I use some barbecue ash and you can see that the two drops have managed to withdraw completely into the pollen chamber, but the one drop is stuck, the top right hand drop, and that's because the charcoal is blocking the entrance to the pollen chamber. So to put this into perspective, um, it took on average 30 minutes um, for the pollination drops to withdraw completely. And I had to manually record this as one minute segments and then stitch them all together. So it was very exciting on the one hand, but um, a bit like watching paint dry on the other hand. What is quite clear though, is the potential issues caused by having such a non-specific pollination mechanism because false pollination, which can be triggered by dust or ash or foreign pollen results in empty seeds. Now fertilization in, in juniper occurs in the summer. Um, it's sometimes delayed to the following year. Uh, the berries usually contain on average three seeds, but often only one or two of them are filled. And you can see that indicated in the immature berry in the center by the letters with F. And it's one empty seed as well. What happens is large quantities of empty seeds are produced each year. And this is partly due to the weather, um, particularly rain and wind during pollination or pollen dispersal. Um, but high temperatures during fertilization and embryo development have also been linked to poor seed quality. So in this image, you can see the mature berries on the left-hand side. You can see a section through an immature berry with the filled and empty seeds. You can also see some resin vesicles uh, quite liquid resin vesicles in the center indicated by an R and then we've got seeds on the right hand side that have been extracted from the berries and they have several resin vesicles on top of them. The seed quality is also influenced by seed predators and in Britain the main predators are the juniper seed chalcids and aerophyte mites, which sometimes cause large crop losses. And this image shows the characteristic exit holes of juniper seed chalcids in the berries, which resemble 10 pin rolling balls. So those are the two on the right hand side. Um, and it also shows some characteristic fluted seed coats in the bottom left. And these are caused by aerophyte mites. And the mites are very, very small, pink or yellow carrot shapes. Um, which are just about visible in the top left-hand image. Now, juniper produces seeds that have deep physiological dormancy and require warm and cold stratification to germinate successfully. The warm phase allows the embryos to mature and the inhibitors to leach out of the seed coat, while the cold phase breaks dormancy by removing any chemical and blocks or inhibitors. And we've got three treatments here um, with different warm durations. So two, eight and 16 weeks. And the graph simply shows that extending the warm phase enabled a few more seeds to germinate, but delayed seedling emergence by an equal length of time. So European ash is a large broadleaf um, occurring naturally throughout Europe, um, but in Britain it's under threat from a non-native fungal pathogen, Hymenoscarpus fraxineus, which causes ash dieback. Now ash also produces male and female flowers on separate trees, but sometimes produces bisexual flowers, which may or may not have functional anthers. So there's a continuum of sex expression. And if you look at the image, the top left of female flowers, the center of bisexual flowers, and the right hand image of male flowers. And these flowers are produced in April or May. They're wind pollinated, and after fertilization and seed maturation, which occur in the same year, they produce large bunches of these characteristic winged fruits, which are known as samaras or keys. 
Now the fruits usually contain a single seed and these seeds are classed as orthodox, which means they can be stored for several decades. Now ash fruits have a very complicated dormancy mechanism known as morphophysiological dormancy. There are two parts to it, morphological dormancy and physiological dormancy. So in the first part, the seeds are shed when the embryos are very small and underdeveloped, and they simply need time to grow to a species specific size. And this usually requires six to 16 weeks of warm stratification. And the second part, the physiological part, the embryos contain inhibitors, including abscisic acid, and these prevent germination unless the seeds are subjected to a further 16 or 24 weeks of cold stratification at between three and five degrees. The outer coverings of the um, ash fruits also contain inhibitors, which need to be leached out to enable the seeds to germinate. So in this graph, we've got warm stratification along the bottom, the x-axis, 16 weeks of warm stratification, and along the y-axis, we've got embryo occupancy. And that's simply a measure of the length of embryo over the length of the seed. And you can see that the seeds at shedding had embryos that were occupying about 55% of the seed length, but the embryos grew during warm stratification and after 16 weeks reached around about 80%. Typically, the seeds can be transferred to cold stratification when the embryos are about 75% of the seed length, because the embryos can then continue to grow to their full length under cold conditions, although this is a bit slower. Now, as I mentioned before, it's always good practice to test for seed quality, particularly during such a long, long dormancy breakage process. So I would typically do a tetrazoleum test at time zero when collecting the seeds, followed by fortnightly measurements of embryo occupancy during warm stratification and followed by an excise embryo test after 16 to 18 weeks of cold stratification. What I wanted to show you in this picture though, was a little bit more about the seed structure. So as you can see, the embryos are about 50% of the seed length. But unlike oak, with its very large, fleshy cotyledons, the cotyledons in ash are paper thin and quite small. And that's because the storage reserves are in the endosperm, which is indicated in the top right hand, sorry, top left hand um, image. A particularly useful test for dormancy breakage in deeply dormant seeds is the excised embryo test. And the embryos are carefully removed from the seeds and they're placed on moistened filter paper, incubated at 20 degrees for 21 days. And live embryos, which are dormant, will remain firm and fresh, while non-dormant embryos will germinate. Dead embryos will turn brown or um, become infected with fungus. And this is quite a, a quick test um, to check for progress along the dormancy breakage mechanism. So these graphs show the impact of different durations of warm and cold stratification on the timing of germination in ash. And along the x-axis, uh, there's time in days, and while on the y-axis, it's cumulative germination. So for instance, if one looks at the top left-hand graph where the seeds have been exposed to eight weeks warm stratification followed by 16 weeks cold stratification, between 20 and 60% of the seeds germinated after were within 56 days. So that's quite poor. But if you look at the middle graph where the seeds have had 12 weeks warm and 20 weeks cold, between 60 and 80% of the seeds have germinated within 56 days. The bottom line is that there are no shortcuts when it comes to breaking morphophysiological dormancy in seeds. But the outcome of this mechanism for seeds under natural conditions is that ash fruits will be 
were sold and germinated in the, in the first year, um, but usually in the second or third year after shedding. And lastly, an iconic tree. So you often produces good seed crops um, or berries. The red berries um, attract birds and animals, animals to promote seed dispersal. And these berries are, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. I've missed out um, all the bits about the reproductive cycle. So you seeds um, produce male and female flowers on separate trees. Um, and what you've got there in this image is a female flower on the left-hand side with a pollination drop. And in the middle, you've got um, male flowers that are shedding pollen. Now, unlike juniper, um, you seeds only have one pollination drop per flower. And pollination, fertilization, and sh seed shedding all occur in one year rather than three years. So you berries um, have fleshy berries that attract the um, animals and, and birds to promote seed dispersal. The berries are removed during processing using a macerator, resulting in small, hard, green-brown seeds. And these seeds are orthodox, so they can be stored for long periods. The problem is that uh, germination is often poor and seldom occurs in the first year, once again due to morphophysiological dormancy. Now, as in ash, you seeds are shed when the embryos are underdeveloped and small. So they require long warm cold stratification to grow to a species specific length to break dormancy. And at dispersal, the embryos are approximately a third of the seed length, but they elongate during warm cold stratification. You'll also note that the seeds have very thick seed coats and these act as a physical barrier to germination. But during warm stratification, the seed coats gradually crack and eventually split as the embryos enlarge even further during cold stratification. Now, sometimes acid treatments are used to mimic the passage of seeds through the gut of a bird or an animal, but this alone cannot substitute for warm cold stratification. And there's also a very high risk of damage both to the seeds and the humans applying the treatment. Now, as an ash, it's always good practice to check seed viability during the long dormancy breakage process. The excised embryo test in you is slightly more challenging because it needs a degree of brute force to crack the seed coats. And this is best done in a clamp while wearing safety glasses as the hard seed coats tend to shatter. Seed coat removal alone does not promote germination but germination is more rapid and uniform than for intact seeds under similar stratification conditions. Now, unlike ash, which has the same dormancy mechanism, you seeds need repeated cycles of warm and cold stratification to break dormancy. And if you look at this graph along the x-axis at the bottom, we have time in weeks up to 96 weeks and along the y-axis, we've got cumulative germination. And at the top of each graph is a line with red and blue blocks, and that represents the duration of the warm cold treatments. So if you look at the top left-hand graph, 12 weeks warm, 12 weeks cold, repeated four times, you'll see that germination has occurred in a stepwise step way. And that means that not all seeds are equally dormant. And obviously that's not very optimal for a commercial process where you want all the seeds to germinate uniformly and rapidly. So for commercial purposes, a better seed treatment would be the middle graph with 24 weeks warm, 24 weeks cold cycled twice, where there's over 80% germination within that time frame. The bottom line is that um, this type of mechanism means that germination is likely to occur over several years. 
was again a bet hedging strategy, which spreads the risk over time. So that's a quick whiz around the world of tree seeds. And I'm going to end with a quote. Um, a seed, after all, is an embryo, a potential plant waiting for its moment to grow. It has what it needs to begin, but it can also put itself on pause. It can wait. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila. Um, uh, lots and lots um, of things to explore there. Would you mind taking the, the presentation down for a sec so that people can see us? And then we're going to explore some of the questions um, that have come in. So, so Alan's asked a question about what happens, what's likely to happen with the fact that with climate change, we're getting shorter and milder winters. Um, and he's and he asked the question about whether or not um, that's going to impact on our tree seeds, whether that's going to impact on our species, whether that's going to impact upon the future of certain species in the landscape. Um, any thoughts on that? So, so that's quite a, a tricky question to answer because um, there's no one size fits all answer. Um, for some species, such as uh, Scots pine, uh, where you only need a relatively short pre-chill, those conditions might still be met even with warmer, shorter winters. But um, for some of the species like ash and yew, where you need weeks and weeks of pre-chill um, below a critical temperature, which is about four degrees, then um, it, it might not be met. Those, those conditions might not be met. And it means that germination would become even more sporadic. And, and sort of his question then goes on to suggest or to ask, you know, under those conditions, would we be just thinking about growing them under control conditions just to get the just to get the seeds to germinate, you know, having to take them into labs, for example? Um, I, I suppose we could. Um, we could germinate them in labs, we could stratify them in labs and then sow them as seeds. That would probably be the most effective way. Um, there always are biosecurity risks, um, potentially. Um, so it's not ideal perhaps moving plants from plants that um, could be in a, in a very sensitive environment. Um, so possible, but not necessarily a good idea. Yeah, this. yeah. Okay. Um, so so when you were showing the uh, yew berry, basically uh, um, within the yew berry, the, the, the plant begins to develop. And it's only when you said it reaches about a third the size of the, of the embryo, uh, sorry, of, of the seed, that the embryo then gets to the place where it starts to thinking about developing. Is that true of all of them, all seeds? Or is there a, is there a species specific size that the embryo gets to within the, within the seed coat? So for um, species with that type of dormancy mechanism, morphophysiological dormancy, um, the, the embryos will be said, shed um, usually around about 30 or 50% of the seed length. Um, and that, that, is, that is pretty much um, species specific. So it's fairly common in, in all new species. Um, I think it's pretty common probably in, in ash species as well. Um, yeah. and, and there'll be a number, another, a number of other species. And Melanie's asked, related to that, how do hazelnuts germinate? Is it is it working in the same sort of strategy? How do they? How does the embryo break the seed coat on a on a hazelnut? No. So so um, I, I haven't actually done any work on on hazelnuts, but um, hazelnuts will probably respond very much like acorns. So um, they might need a chill, but um, most of the most of the um, ac most of the hazelnut will actually be cotyledon. So it's a completely different um, process. And, and that, that means that um, the, the outer coating of the hazelnut will simply weather um, over winter and, and the acorn will, uh, sorry, the, the hazelnut will germinate. Okay. So um, uh, we had some questions about whether or not the tests that you've outlined, so, you know, the tetra, tetrazolium test and some of the others. So I don't really, we, she and I worked together with a colleague um about 20 years ago and we produced some guidance called the good seed guide which was which was a sort of 
um, simplification of some of this of this stuff that Sheila's been talking about. Um, so the question that the, was asked by the by the audience was things like tetrazolium tests are, are they are they for the amateur or are they really only for the professionals? Um, and does things like the float test for acorns work as well as some of your other more technical things if you're if you're just doing it non commercially? So if we start off with um, the float test, the float test um, is brilliant. Um, it works really well on on a lot of species, um, and oak is a classic where it will separate out all, separate out all the empty and insect infested seeds very quickly. Um, I would still do a cut test just to check that you know the proportion of of acorns, for instance, that are insect infested, and and that's quick and easy to do. The tetrazolium test um, is not perhaps suitable for an amateur. Um, it's quite technical, and there are different um, staining patterns for different species. But but certainly something like the excise embryo test um, is is not complex. Um, you just need a little bit of technical skill and, and patience, really. Okay. Um, Louise Louise said, given the complexity of some of this of this, um, you know, we don't think about it. It's the biology that's going on, you know, mm -hmm. mostly unseen. Um, so she's wondering whether we need to be putting more effort into just thinking about how we promote some of those trees, how we get those trees out there into the countryside. And and particularly, she was thinking about whether ash trees, whether we should be collecting ash seed, whether it's worth collecting ash seed for propagation for future as an amateur, not necessarily as a lab. So um, I, th I think, I mean, I, I'm always keen to promote um, species. Um, in terms of ash, I think there's no restriction now about collecting ash fruits. Um, but I think that it's probably mostly worth collecting ash fruits if you collecting from a, a tree that's likely to be resistant to ash dieback rather than collecting any uh, fruits from a sort of random ash tree. Um, you, you obviously want to try and collect the best seeds or the best fruits available when you when you collecting seeds regardless of species. Yeah, and and for those of you that um, haven't yet seen many disease resistant ash, they do. There are still some really nice ash trees out there. It's not, however, just how it looks in one year. It's worth watching an ash tree for a number of years to see what's happening, because they are there are some out there that are now the one ash tree left standing in a landscape with all the others yeah. have gone. And as Sheila said, those become the ones that are definitely worth looking at the seed collecting from, but. As far as I'm aware, there's no guarantee that there are those resistant trees are going to produce resistant seedlings, and so it will be it will be um, worth worth trying um, as many as you can from those from those trees. So um, I'm getting a message. At, see Katie's point. I don't know. Um, so Katie said two years ago, I knew nothing about any of this. She collected ash trees from healthy trees. She's put a very large pot of compost and sand and forgot about it. This spring, <laughs> she's absolutely found dozens of seedlings yeah. that she's planted them out in pots, and they are apparently all doing brilliantly, which is is exactly the point that you were making, I think. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and that and that, Katie, as as Sheila said, it's that two year dormancy. You know, it's it's sometimes that it needs a couple of winters. It needs that long timeline. Um, and she wonders if there's anything better she could have done than that, or whether that was actually quite a good strategy. Well, I mean, it worked. So um, I, I think I think she's on to a winner there. Um, if, if you want more precise results, um, what you can do is, is soak the seeds um, and then put them in a plastic bag, try to make sure that the seeds aren't soaking wet, so perhaps pat them down with, wet pa uh, with paper towels to remove any surface moisture. Um, leave the top of the bag slightly open and then you can mimic what I did in the lab and move them from a warmer environment um, for X number of weeks, sort of six to 10 weeks. And once they're completed that, then just put them into your fridge. And that might be a quicker process. It should shave off um, a good few weeks or, or possibly even months from, from your process. But there was nothing wrong say, with your process. <laughs> I have to say, changing the topic entirely, I. I was deeply, deeply impressed with your juniper video. I think the, um, <laughs> the the effort of standing there watching the paint dry was fabulous because I have 
in 35 years of doing this, I've never seen that explained or displayed before. Um, and and now I want to go and see it. I really <laughs> want to go and see my juniper pollen drop. Um, so I need to th to know when when is the right time to go out and have a look for juniper pollen drops. So so it's very very tricky for juniper. Um, that uh, those twigs were collected from hotting down. So um, it was around about May, early May, from from what I remember. And I think the trick, because I haven't seen that many pollination drops, to be fair, is to go early in the morning when the seeds, when the um, bushes are are really um, well watered, basically, or, you know, um, well hydrated, if you like. Um, I've seen a few pollination drops on on you and perhaps a bit on, on Lawson Cypress, but you really do need to get the timing right because it's a very small window and um, they vanish very, very quickly. So there's your challenge, everybody. Uh, I, will, I, want, I want heads up whenever you find a, a juniper pollen drop so that I can come and, <laughs> come and go, go out and do it at the right time of year. Um, there was something you mentioned in that, in the juniper piece about the little resin vesicles on the outside mm. of the seed. I, I wondered, um what was their purpose so um i think that there must be some sort of um pathogen pest prevention mechanism um that, that that's the only possible um reason i can think of um they contain a lot of terpenes that are typically found in a lot of your penny products um yeah. so so I, I think that that's what they do um obviously they are very very sticky they're small brilliant um but they're quite horrible to process yeah, yeah i can imagine especially if they as you say contain smelling strong smelling chemicals yeah. um we have a question about um black poplars i know it's not necessarily of, on your list and maybe you, you don't know the answer but um there's somebody who was very interested in the ability to be able to produce viable seed from black poplars rather than going down the cutting route do you know about, or, or the cloning route, do you know anything about black poplars? No, I'm afraid I never worked on it. Um, no. Never worked on that one. All I know, all I know is that uh, all the experiments I've seen done on black poplar and all the work I've seen done on black poplar is that it needs, it has very, very sensitive seed that requires almost instant, it la needs to land on damp ground and, and wet mud adjacent to trees almost instantly um and i heard an expert talking once about the fact that it probably only had something like six to ten hours of being viable after being dispersed so it's that and it appeared also to matter if it was tromped into the into the earth by animals hooves so wh whoever the question was from if you want to try um to improve that my best suggestion is find that day that the seed's being spread and then just push it into the soil with your boots, just literally stomp it down into the wet mud as soon as it lands, because it seems to be really, really sensitive and doesn't like to be to be out there in the in the wild on its own. Uh, Jane's asked about elms. Um, they've got a project on elms in Wiltshire where they're looking at um, are trying to propagate uh, resistant hybrids across the county or, or elms that might be showing resistance. Have you got any advice on the space of elm seeds? Have you done any work on elm seeds? No, no, I haven't. Um, I, I presume, are, are, they, are they thinking about doing controlled crosses then? or? No, I think just basically how to get the seeds to germinate as much as it is. Yeah. Sorry, Jane, if I got that wrong. If, you, if I have, please ask. But Yeah, no. so... Uh, you know nothing about the specialty of germinating elm seeds. No, I, I don't think it will have a particularly complex um, dormancy mechanism. Um, I suspect it probably just needs a bit of a chill. Um, that, that 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 is the most. So, what's called physiological dormancy is the most common dormancy mechanism um, worldwide, and and most seeds just need a relatively short, moist chill at four degrees. Okay, thank you. Um, I, 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 we're getting sort of almost close to time and I think it would be a crying shame if we didn't explore what was actually going on behind you. So what are the purple bags? I'm just curious of what they all or look like purple bags. What are they for? Okay, so I'm, I'm sitting in um, the light room um, of my lab and what you're seeing there are actual bags, they're petri dishes, petri dishes laid out and each of those petri dishes 
contain my artificial embryos, my clonal embryos that are busy germinating on the jelly-like medium. So, so what we essentially are trying to do in the lab is um, mimic what Mother Nature does. Um, we do a control cross each year, um, selecting for traits like good growth or good wood density and good form. And um, then we take out the embryo from the seed and we bulk it up um, through a process called somatic immagenesis. And that produces clones or genetically identical copies of that um, original seed. And what, what you're seeing there are, are thousands and thousands of, of clonal embryos. <laughs> Always surprises me how many embryos you can get in such a small space. Um, and and you say they're clonal. So how do you how do you ensure that there's genetic diversity in that in that cloning? Yeah. So so obviously one of the things that we're trying to do is to exploit the genetic gains. And that means that you do want to try and narrow genetic diversity to some extent. But the way we make sure that we don't um, narrow that base too much is by doing different crosses each year. So we use different parents um, and the seeds that are produced by those parents will all produce slightly different um, character traits. So they will be a bit like siblings with the same parents where they, they will all be slightly different. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got about three minutes left before we go and there are a couple of sort of, um, there's a gin related question. And I think as we're almost, <laughs> as we're almost to time, we might, we might do the gin related question. Um, and, and the question was whether, you know, with gin becoming more popular these days, um, or at least more popular than it was relatively recently, because if you're around in Hogarth's time, gin was not particularly a good thing in the mid 18th century when, when gin was known as um, mother's ruin and people used to collapse on, in gin soaked, <laughs> gin soaked alleys. Um, but, but the, the thought process that follows that is at the moment, a lot of that, a lot of that uh, gin is produced from Macedonian, from, from, yep. from Macedonia and from the junipers of Macedonia. So the question then comes, do you think even if people wanted to, it would be possible to massively increase our native juniper population or is it, is it actually just always going to remain a relatively minor species? I think it's um, probably going to remain a minor species. Um, and that's mostly because the juniper in South England is, is struggling. And there are a number of reasons for that. Some of it's climate related. Um, some of it is simply because the populations are so small. And because you need both male and female bushes for successful reproduction, um, in some cases, you you don't have functional populations anymore. Um, so I think there's a better chance up in Scotland where the juniper populations are perhaps um, bigger and, and more healthy, but certainly in, in England, um, I think it'd be a bit of a struggle to harvest enough berries for your gin. Shame, I quite fancy locally produced gin. <laughs> it might be a very long time before I can get any then from the sounds of that. We are almost up against time, everyone. Um, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to draw us to a close. Um, thank you for um, joining us today. Uh, thank you, Sheila, immensely for that. For that, there were so many things that I didn't know. Someone's in that. at the front door doorbell. As you can hear, somebody's at my front door doorbell. It's, it's slightly awkward. Everybody, apologise for that. Um, <laughs> so many things I didn't know, and I really, really want to go and see a juniper drop now. I'm going to go and hunt down my local junipers in the early spring. Uh, we have. Uh, and our last session for, uh, for the audience, we have our last session next week where we're going to be looking at the uh, Millennium Seed Bank and the roles of uh, storage and preservation of, of seed and how that, that matters in terms of the conservation and biodiversity of our tree species. So please do join us with um, folks from the Millennium Seed Bank next week. I would like to say a huge thank you to Sheila uh, for giving us so, so much useful information as I say, I'm really, really obsessed by the thought of a juniper drop now. So um, that's going to be my spring project. Uh, thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Um, and unless my colleagues have anything else they want to say to everybody, um, have a lovely afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chula, and we'll see you next week, hopefully. Um, so join us next week. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you.